Now we'll proceed to uh, today's program. Today's program is presented in honor of Architecture Week and is co-sponsored by the American Institute of Architects, the Portland chapter. We thank them for making this program possible. Our board host is Andrew Wheeler, member of the Board of Governors and Architect and Planner. He will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speaker. The second question today will be asked by Jay Gerard, co-chair of the club's Art and Culture Committee. Our speakers today, it will be a panel. We'll have uh, three architects, uh, and they are Robert Frasca, principal with a Z ZGF partnership. No other firm signature is on so much of the city from the transit mall to major high rises to cultural and educational centers. In 1992, the AIA uh, selected ZGF as its firm of the year nationally. Our second uh, panel member is Robert Thompson, a principal with Thompson Vivoda Architects. He's best known for his design on the Nike campus and the retrofit of the old Sears building for the new Metro headquarters. And the third panel member is Thomas Hacker, principal of Thomas Hacker and Associates, a former University of Oregon professor. He has recently gained a reputation for his campus building designs, including the Nursing Center and Biomedical Information Communication Center at OHSU and the Signature Project at Lewis and Clark, which is currently underway. He recently completed the Spokane Public Library. And then on our panel, uh, moderating, I should say, our panel is Randy Gregg, architect, art and architect writer for the Oregonian. He has written on art in the Northwest for 13 years. He was founding editor of Reflex, a Seattle-based arts journal, and co-founder of Second Thursday, a discussion series also in Seattle. He came to the Oregonian in 1989 to cover art and cultural politics. In 1993, he established the first regular coverage of architectural issues at the Oregonian. For the 1994 academic year, he is the uh, National Arts Journalism Fellow at Columbia University in New York, where he is studying urban design and architecture. With that, I'll turn it over to our moderator. Thank you. <coughs> On the Portland City Club's letterhead, there's a logo featuring five of Portland's most prominent landmarks, the Coin Tower, the First Interstate Bank, PacWest, the Portland Building, in the building we sit in now, which most of us uh, fondly refer to as Big Pink. As a group of uh, Portland's most influential citizens, the City Club could have used many images for its logo, but it chose a quintet of shapes from the skyline. And I think when most of us think about the idea of Portland in our mind's eye, what we come up with is, is something similar. You know, it might be the, uh, five, those five buildings, or it might be the view from Vista Bridge. Um, it might be the skyline set against the sort of velvet green of the West Hills. It might be Pioneer Courthouse Square filled with people at lunchtime. Whatever, when you think of Portland, as with almost any city, the background, if not the entire image, is architectural. Its most memorable and prominent features have been, in effect, designed. Despite the prominence of architecture in, in its logo, City Club, in its many years of these Friday lunchtime speeches, has rarely, if ever, focused on design as an issue. I don't really raise this as a criticism, but more as an indication of the ambiguous regard with which we as a culture hold the image of our city. We talk about the livability of the city in the abstract as though it were something like the warm sun on our backs. Um, we imagine it can be preserved with lots of police, with um, lots of parking spaces, um, rather than in the details of how a high rise meets the street or what makes a good ho row house instead of a bad one. Indeed, most of us regard our homes as our castles, moreover, as something of our self-portraits, yet more than 90% of our houses um, have been built from generic builder's plans right off the shelf. Amazingly, fewer than 20% of all the buildings constructed in the U.S. were designed by architects. Yet if someone introduces themselves at a, at a party as an architect, most of, them regard them, most of us regard them with a bit of wonderlust. Um, unlike the growing majority of us who uh, Treasury Secretary Robert Reich would describe as symbol manipulators, the architect actually makes something, and something most of us would agree, at least in the abstract, is, is significant. But we may never have actually noticed what that fellow in the horn rim glasses or the bow tie standing at the party has built. Um, <laughs> but if it lasts over a hundred years, we will sure fight to preserve it, usually invoking their name as a part of the building's uh, historical pedigree. 
I would argue, actually, that architecture is probably the most overrated profession there is. And in the same breath, I would also <laughs> argue that it's the most underappreciated profession. So with these contradictions and ambiguities in mind, um, today we're going to bring three of the top architects in the city to the table to tell us a little bit about what they do. Um, I think this is an, a really rare treat and an all too rare, uh, all too rare treat. Um, it's also part of a sort of larger rare treat this week that I hope you all know about the American Institute of Architects second annual architecture week. And the theme appropriately for this year's set of programs is Portland Architecture, a Public Concern. And I'm sure you can find a brochure somewhere in this room. Our city's going to change in the next 20 years, I think, rather dramatically. I think most of us would agree with that. Um, and these three designers are, li are the likely candidates to give that change architectural form. Um, while they're the, at the top of their field here, the reactions to the work, much like the reactions to the profession as a whole, um, are you know, an interesting mixture usually of back pats and back stabs. Um, Bob Frasca, as you of course know, um, was, is the F and ZGF, um, by far the largest firm in the city and um, the single largest contributor of silhouettes to that skyline. Um, Frasca's been, aesthetic has been called a fine example of architectural good citizenship by some and the perfect example of why Portland is so bland by others. Either way, you can't deny his impact on, on, the, uh, on, on the skyline with landmarks like Coin Tower and the World Trade Center, the Marriott Hotel, the Justice Center, OMSI, it goes on and on. Bob Thompson of Thompson Vivota Architects blends um, a coolly modern architectural vision with uh, what I would describe as the instincts of a sculptor. Um, I think Bob thinks of his buildings as work, works of art. Um, certainly no building sums this up more than the Moyer Meditation Chapel on Rocky Butte. Um, as he's currently at work on three museum projects, the Evergreen Air Venture Museum in McMinnville, the Lincoln Museum in Indiana, and the Steinbeck Museum in California. Last year, he completed the elegant renovation of the old Sears building, which we tend to call the, the recycled building. I think thanks to something I wrote. But, um, um, but he's perhaps best known, um, as he was introduced earlier, as, as the designer of the Nike World Campus, which has um, been called both as a compliment and a scathing rebuke, the perfect architectural manifestations of, corporate, of, of Nike's corporate values. <laughs> Tom Hacker is an iconoclast who strongly believes architecture has an obligation to help us define contem contemporary civic symbolism. A teacher of architecture at U of O until 1984, Hacker is still relatively young as a builder. His key projects so far have included the High Desert Museum, the Big Center, the School of Nursing, um, and the Spokane Public Library, but there's a lot more to come, including um, the signature project, a three-building complex that will basically forever change the Lewis and Clark campus. Tom has had the rare honor among architects of having his design of the Spokane, Spokane um, Public Library reviewed favorably, I might add, not on the architect, not on the cultural page, but on the editorial page of the local newspaper. But his rigorous blend of modernist function and classical forms leaves some cold, like the Indian leaders um, who lamented his proposed design for their tribal museum was, quote, just a box. None of these architects could be called really radical, and, um, I, I th but I think that they're three men with really three demonstratively, demonstratively different attitudes and aesthetics. Um, and in my conversations with them, it's actually on the subject of the skyline that their differences become most clear. Bob Frasca, you have often claimed that you don't really care about the skyline. You say your concern is with the street and how buildings meet the street and the sense of community that can be built from that. Yet the city's two most demonstrative landmarks, Coin Tower and the Convention Center, are your designs. On the one hand, some of its, and, and then on the other hand, um, um, some of its most nondescript silhouettes carry your, your name sort of in the, in the um, corner. Um, I guess what I would like to know is, is what unifies um, two buildings like the Marriott and, and Coin Center, or the Coin Center and um, the Justice Center as landmarks? And, and if you could talk a little bit about what your philosophy is, what you feel the responsibility of an architect is who, who is putting something kind of in our view. Does this thing work? Whoops. Uh, I guess the th I think uh, the most important thing about landmarks in the skyline is, is that, that they should identify places in the city that are important 
or they should identify institutions in the building, I'm sorry, in the city that are important. Now, in the case of COIN, uh, you can say that COIN is not an important institution, but when we were doing the building, it was an important place in the downtown because it was really sort of a focal point between what was the urban renewal area and what was the conventional downtown. So therefore, I mean, there was a rationale as far as I was concerned that it should be a landmark. I think the convention center uh, is a building that obviously should identify Portland to people that visit it. It should be a welcoming kind of a building. And I think that the landmark, uh, the, the lanterns of the building uh, are things that, you know, also function. They let light into the pre-function areas, but they also make a connection between the in between the east side of the city and the west side, which is one of the principal reasons that we wanted that kind of a landmark, because the fact was is that when the convention center was built, uh, that part of the city, uh, at least uh, relative to the skyline in a public building, was sort of nowhere. So I think that it's really important to think about these things, because you know, there are a lot of cities where everyone is striving to be a landmark, and it really just makes a cacophony that, that uh, isn't really all that distinctive. And if you think of even a city like New York, you think of two or three buildings, whether it's the Empire State Building uh, or the Chrysler Building, there's still only a very, very few distinctive buildings. And I think that then someone sort of needs to judge, and maybe it's a design review board or whatever, uh, which building should fulfill that role. Thank you. <coughs> Bob Thompson, you've often <coughs> spoken to me anyway, rather fondly, the experience of rounding the bend by Boeing Field and seeing Seattle skyline materialize on the horizon like it really was the Emerald City. Um, you said that what Portland really needs is a few good tall buildings. Um, for the Fox Block, you proposed a, a gleaming eccentric glass tower that would have added a significant piece of sculpture to the skyline, um, but would have also cast a rather cool shadow on the city's public square. What to you is, is the value of something like Seattle Skyline, and why would we want something like that here? Well, I think uh, one of the things about Seattle, much like Chicago, or, 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 is the opportunity to come here and create a greater sense of downtown. I think one of the things that's unique about Portland, unlike a lot of cities, is that we have it contained with a lot of the, the, the South Hills and that, so the density opportunity that, that can occur downtown, I think, is phenomenal. And I think creating a greater sense of place and a greater dra sculptural drama to the skyline is something that Portland uh, has a uh, great opportunity for. So I think our solution to the, 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 the Fox Block uh, was one where we were trying to develop a building that we felt was highly sculpted, that, was, uh, that would create a very strong uh, reaction to the uh, Pioneer Place, uh, uh, Pioneer Square, I should say, um, in a way that it was very responsive to how people viewed it from the square and at the same time was very inviting and very open to the square because a lot of things that we're trying to do in that particular building as it relates to the square would be to kind of energize uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the street level activities that currently don't exist uh, around that area right now. Um, Tom, you can kind of claim innocence in this crowd. You've never designed a major high rise or uh, even proposed one that I know of. Um, do you want to? And uh, <coughs> say no. <laughs> and do you think you can meld your uh, your belief in architecture's pot potential civic symbolism uh, um, with the realities of a corporate spec office tower? Well, first of all, I'd love to, and. Uh, well. I think that, uh, I mean, my, my, my understanding of skylines is that they're a really powerful expression of the character of a city and, in, in a sense, the character of the people in a city. I, I see the skyline of any city as being, in a, in a way, it's, it's a set of individuals uh, that are arranged in a grouping that are not unlike individuals on a stage or in a dance or something like that. And, that, and I think that, that as in any grouping of any culture, uh, those groupings benefit from a sense of both the diversity of individuals and also from some sense of a unification or a kind of clarity of the whole. I think the skyline in Portland, for instance, benefits most when you see it in a way that you see the diversity of the kinds of buildings and also the historical periods of buildings. And I think we, we talk about a skyline as if it's one thing, but in fact it's a really incredible kind of large sculptural element. I agree with that that is seen in motion most of the time from varying points of view most of the time. So that, for instance, in Portland, 
if you stand on the Vista Bridge, you get a view of the skyline, which I think is really rich, because from that side you see that kind of layering of history of, of the various buildings that have come through time into this area. Uh, and I think it's not as rich from the east side because most of the new buildings tend to be on that eastern edge and it makes it a little more kind of, uh, you know, monolithic in terms of its character. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the other really great experience of this city's skyline, and this is I think the only good thing about I-5 being on the near east side, is the view of the city as you drive I-5 at night especially which is a real thrill, I think, and a, and a really rare kind of introduction to the, to the image of a whole city. And I, um, I mean, I, I was actually personally kind of shocked by the green line on top of the Bank of America building as an indication, I think, of what Bob was talking about, of one building sort of yelling for attention in the midst of this whole group of buildings. And it's a really fundamentally destructive thing, I think, to that feeling that it is, in fact, a community of buildings and that it represents the character of this community. If each of you could add something to the, the skyline, would, would you add a taller building? Would you add, uh, there really isn't a strong focal point in the same way that there is in Seattle in terms of the Columbia Center there. Uh, um, there isn't one sort of beacon building, aside from this one standing apart from the crowd. This one is. Yes, yes, but I mean in terms of, of, of the grouping, there isn't a, a, a strong focal point. What would each of you add to this skyline if you could sort of put some, draw something into the picture? Well, you know, I mean, when I think of powerful skylines, I always remember approaching Chart <coughs> Cathedral, where it's the only thing in the skyline, and it's very, very beautiful. I mean, what I'm, I think is important is there's something that's singular and very beautiful. I mean, I happen to think that the Columbia Tower building in Seattle is a really mediocre building, and it's too bad. I mean, you know, if you get far away from it, it's okay. But anytime you're up near it, it's, it's really a third-rate building. And, and so to have a building like that be the symbol of the city, I, I find questionable. And so I guess, again, what I'd say is, is that, it's, first of all, it's got to be good. And secondly, it would be nice if it was something that was important. Mm -hmm. Bob? Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with that. I agree with the building in Seattle. I think that, uh, for me, the opportunities that we have here, I would like to see a number of larger, taller buildings here. I'd like to see the density of downtown increase significantly, whether it be with office or with housing. I would like to see more mixed-use activity occur in, in the downtown area, much more than what we have right now. I think we need that kind of critical mass to kind of energize downtown. I think there's been some major strides made over the last few years, but I think more than anything, as both these gentlemen have said, that the uh, skyline becomes uh, um, a collection of pieces more than it does one any one building, and, and I, th I feel that uh, the opportunity to create that is 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 still waiting here. Um, it's a good segue into the next thing I wanted to talk to you all about. Um, with all of these people who are supposedly coming, um, half a million we hear, uh, the future success of, of Portland as a city is really going to depend on how. Uh, depend heavily on how many of these newcomers we can lure into living da into in downtown. Um, you know, that key word, density. One consistently cited success um, in terms of media, medium densing, density housing project is River Place, uh, which blends medium density with kind of one of the key th things that's really great about Portland, the river. Uh, considering there's plenty of uh, riverfront living still to be had, um, the River District, the Schnitzer Zeidel properties north of the McAdam Bridge, and as well as uh, uh, points northwest along the Willamette. What lessons should we learn from River Place? And uh, could each of you kind of give us a critique and, and some concrete ideas for improvements that could be made in the future uh, in future riverfront housing projects? Uh, why, why don't you start, Bob? Well, I mean, I, I, I personally find the River Place to be a very successful example of, of our urban development, so to speak. And I think that uh, one of the things that it's lacking right now is a continuation of a lot more of that kind of development. I think it needs a critical mass to in, in order to kind of sustain itself. And uh, I think one of the great opportunities that we have here with the uh, development, the uh, river uh, district to the north and with the river place development to the south, there's there both of those developments create major opportunities for the people of Portland to be able to interact with the river. And currently, to date, I think the River Place is the only place that allows for that to happen right now. And I think, historically, there's always been a frustration that I've had that, that the city 
be it on the east side and definitely on the on the uh, on the west side here has always pulled itself back away from the river itself and your opportunities to become involved and to interact with that have been very limited and I think developments like the river place and 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 like the river district have this opportunity to bring a lot of people and a lot of very rich mixed uses into the downtown area and I think the 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 livelihood and the uh, the, ener the energetic side of any city relies heavily on the amount of downtown housing that we can bring in and the kind of opportunities that exist that we have here in Portland to involve ourselves with uh, with the river. So, that so you would just arms. Xerox uh, um, the river place development <laughs> no. and, and replicate it along, along the river? Not at what, all. What, what would you change about it? What, what isn't working about it? I think it needs a lot more of that kind of development, that, that rich mixture of housing, mm -hmm. retail, office, residential, and I think that the opportunities in the River District, uh, particularly to start creating more cultural diversities with galleries, with uh, uh, more entertainment districts uh, are, are, are great. And I think if you look at some of the great cities in the world, they, uh, um, San Francisco being probably the closest one here where you have the downtown core of the city, but you have a whole series of sub-communities within that city where, where you have different types of uses. I mean, a, a, a minor example might be uh, 23rd, Northwest 23rd, where there are a lot of uh, different types of nightlife and different types of, uh, of so-called districts that I feel provide a lot of richness to the city that I would like to see these developments being River Place or the River District uh, mm -hmm. continue to reinforce. Tom, what do you think about it? Well, I, I agree that it's, I think, a very positive and, and really important project in the city. Not uh, for one main reason, it's a kind of pioneering effort, and it, I think, took the risk of doing something that wasn't being done. And by doing that, sort of showed everyone the attractiveness and viability of that kind of development. I think the weakness of it, in, in a way not its own fault, is that it's an island. That is, it's sort of completely disconnected from the fabric of the rest of the city. And it's also, I think, in its architectural character, really more suburban than urban. And I, I feel that in a way that it that is both because of the forms that are used, but, but also because it's a very large, more or less homogenous grouping of buildings that uh, isn't subdivided in the way the normal urban fabric is. And I, I think the lesson to be learned from that and this is going to happen here. I've been on the design commission now for a few years, and we've been looking at projects both in that North Macadam area and also down in the River Place area or the um, North uh, River area. I mean, those things are happening. They're being built now. Uh, some of them, they're going to continue to be built. And I think the real lesson there is to insist that that development occur within the 200-foot block structure of the rest of Portland. If we know anything about urban planning in Portland, we should all know that the 200-foot block structure is a real godsend to this city. It's given us a character in terms of scale and in terms of the availability of light and also in terms of the kind of uh, linear feet of facade which has that kind of diversity possible in it that very few cities in the United States have, some in Europe have because it's a smaller <coughs> blocks, block scale in Europe. So I, th I think the most important thing is to respect the history of the city make those places as an extension of the existing city and the historical city, and then develop them as, at the most, one-block structures rather than three or four blocks. Alfresca? Uh, well, these guys have taken most of my lines, but uh, <laughs> uh, there are just a couple of things I'd like to add. I agree with what uh, Bob said about its virtues, and I agree with what uh, Tom said about the things that could be improved. There are a couple of things, though, that I think that can be done in future developments. Uh, one thing is, is that there is no substitute for time passing as something develops because that's one way that an area uh, gets its richness. If you look at Boston, when they developed the South End before the Civil War, it was all done at one time. When they developed Back Bay, they did it in small pieces. And even now, Back Bay is a much, much richer place. Uh, the one way that you can accelerate that, which is some of the realities that we need to face now in you know, the 20th and 21st century, is that once you do get a plan for the area that has squares and 200 by 200 blocks that connect to the city and so forth, you should at least select a lot of different architects to give sort of individual visions within, say, certain constraints. 
because that's one way that I think you can accelerate time. Uh, that's one of the things that they're doing in the Playa Vista project that they're doing in Los Angeles uh, in the old uh, Hughes Airfield thing where they're mm -hmm. you know, coming up with a plan and then they're going to have a lot of people do it over a period of time. And that's one of the things that I would hope would happen in the River District and some of these other, in Schnitzer's Idel. Yeah, I think that that speaks to Tom's critique of the of the suburban nature exactly. of, the, of River Place. Is it is very homogenous. I mean, it feels like a mall. I mean, it's a successful mall, but nonetheless feels like a mall. Um, time passing. I think that's a, a key segue into the next question. Um, hysteric, his, hysteric, historic preservation is a huge concern <laughs> in Portland. There you go. <laughs> a little Freudian slip there. <laughs> um, the city. It's fortunately been sort of spared the 60-style urban renewal, um, suffered in so many other places. Um, yet with the recent upgrading of Portland's seismic requirements, preservation is increasingly becoming a rather costly proposition. Um, one of the key questions we're going to be facing is going, it concerns the Masonic Temple, uh, a.k.a. the uh, Portland Art Museum North um, Wing. Since all of you are museum di designers and uh, all of you are likely going to be vying for that job, I would suspect, uh, uh, maybe you can give us a little preview of what you think should be done with that uh, um, building. Should it be saved? How uh, might you adapt, alter, or uh, expand it? Um, why don't we start with um, Tom? I knew you were going to ask me that. Now, this has got to be real political. This is, yeah, this is, the, this is the toughest one. For a lot of reasons, actually. I mean, it's a very difficult issue. It's, in, in fact, the building itself is uh, architecturally, I think, one of the finest examples of its historical style uh, in the region. Um, it's also obviously both culturally and architecturally, but more so culturally, an anachronism. And it was designed uh, in that way. Um, it's, it's a building which is very, very closed off from its surroundings. It's difficult. It would be difficult to make that building a public building and inviting as public buildings should be without significantly altering its architectural character. And that, that raises the question then, if you're going to alter the architectural character so much, why, you know, why, why preserve it to begin with? Um, I think that, the, I think that the, the question in that is that um, can we as a culture, in, on the one hand, destroy things that are cultural artifacts, like works of architecture, just because they don't fit into the current either architectural or cultural milieu. But on the other hand, can we also afford to preserve works of architecture that were inherently private when they were constructed to be used as major public cultural institutions? And I think that's the, in fact, I was going to suggest that the City Club get a committee and study this issue and come back to, with a recommendation. Um, Get the architects off the hook. I happen, yeah. <laughs> I, I happen to have had two close experiences with this. One is that my firm, with me as a designer, did the restoration of, the, of all of the public spaces in the upper floors of the current art museum, the air galleries, and, and all of the areas on the, that Pietro Belusky had designed in the, in the late 20s and 30s. I also had students when I was teaching who did studies of the Masonic Temple trying to see if it was possible to convert that building into museum space. And what we found was that it is possible to convert those rooms into museum spaces, although they're not the kinds of museum spaces that museum directors now want to have. They, they have no flexibility. They have no chance, most of them, of any natural light. So there's a real trade-off that's made in that. Um, I don't think it's correct to gut a building like that, if that's the suggestion, and just make something else inside it and keep the facade. I mean, I think facades have little meaning without their guts. Um, but it is possible to use that building, I think, as a museum for gallery spaces. And it is also possible, I think, to connect it gracefully to the existing museum. It's also possible, and it's a little more difficult, to use it as school space. There are very good rooms in that place for studio spaces and uh, lecture halls and performance spaces and that kind of thing. So I think it, it could have a purpose in that way. And my sense of the, I don't think that it's an important enough civic historical building to just outright say it absolutely has to be saved. And I'll get killed by the, you know, the preservationists. I happen to personally really like the building. And I, and I think it's 
to me, one of the strongest architectural statements in the inner city. But I don't think it has the kind of historical qualities, either culturally or architecturally, that make it a kind of absolute landmark in the city. Bob Preska? Well, uh, I was going to start this discussion with a, something that uh, uh, that uh, Le Corbusier said once, he was confronted by a preservation group that wanted to save one of his buildings that was going to be demolished, and he said, uh, buildings are like people, uh, you know, they have to die sometime. If you can save them, fine, but it's not really the end of the world. Well, I don't totally agree with that, but uh, I think what it does do is, is that it puts preservation in perspective. I think the thing you have to ask is, what is it you're saving? How much is it a part of the heritage of the city? Uh, and is it intrinsically that wonderful? I think in the case of the Masonic Temple, uh, to me, it's a building that was carefully built. Uh, and it is a building that can last a long time, but I don't think it's an architectural gem. Uh, the reason I understand uh, that it's being considered to be saved is because of its perceived utility, uh, not necessarily because of its merit. The people <coughs> that I've talked to at the museum and on the board and so forth, when pressed, uh, admit that. Uh, now, I don't know enough about the museum's program. I know that studies have been made that, to see how the building can be used and whether it's a good idea and whether the money's well spent. To be honest, I really don't know. Uh, I think uh, building a building between the two uh, is going to be extremely difficult. I've thought about it a lot, uh, as I'm sure that my colleagues here have, and uh, I've had some ideas. I'm not sure they're <coughs> good ones, but uh, I still think it's going to be difficult. Uh, I think that, on the other hand, a totally new building would afford the museum unlimited possibilities. And, uh, uh, but I think that's the thing that they have to measure. One of the things that you asked, though, uh, Randy, was how about the city hall? I mean, spending $18 million on the city hall. I feel differently about that. First of all, I think it's a better building. I think it is part of the history of the city, part of our heritage. And I think that if the $18 million is well spent, again, I don't know what they're going to do with it. but. Uh, I would say that that would be reasonable. Bob Thompson? Well, my office is almost right next door to the Masonic Temple, and I think uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about that issue. I think that's, uh, again, as, as Bob says, it's, it's a very well-built building, and I think that there's a certain architectural heritage, I think, that, that, that's important for us as people in this community to try to retain. I think the uh, architects of that building, who also designed buildings like the neighbors of Woodcraft Hall, the original shrine building, uh, there's some great buildings that this firm has done, and I think that building, there are opportunities there that exist where uh, I feel that the basic composition of the building and, and the structure of the building would allow for some, again, some great opportunities to breathe new life into that existing structure. And I think, that, again, there's a lot of issues that start driving the issue of whether you demolish an existing building or whether you come in and renovate the building. But uh, um, I think that, it, that, that I think in looking at it, there's some uh, great potential to come in there and actually renovate that building in a way where we could we create some very dramatic, very intriguing space and at the same time energize that, that building at the street level and at the same time provide opportunities for some uh, great gallery space as well as archival and educational spaces within the building. I think the issue, uh, I think one of the finest spaces in town is the space between the art museum and the Sonic Temple. I mean, that's a great space to walk through as you're going from, uh, or, or, or as you're walking through town and that. And I mean, I think there are some very nice ways that those buildings could be tied together underground more so and, and, and preserving that park that's in between there. I think that's uh, something that really ought to be looked at. We're okay till 1.30, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, I want to turn <coughs> the subject to um, commercial buildings for a moment. Uh, you know, architecture with a, with a big A uh, projects tend to be civic courthouses and jails and city halls and museums, um, but most, a, most of the buildings actually comprise the city or commercial. Um, <coughs> while architects tend to be the designers, developers are really the ones with the vision and the clout. And um, of course, we all know some are, are visionary, adventuresome, concerned about the public impact of their buildings, and some are decidedly not. Um, basically, right now, the, the only arbiter uh, between architectural idealism and financial expediency in commercial buildings, um, particularly ones within the design review purview of the city, uh, is the design review committee. 
And I'm wondering what you three think about that process, um, especially considering, do you think it's effective, or do you think there's any way that, de that uh, um, this design review process could be given more clout, especially considering that almost every time, in fact, I believe every time, that uh, a developer has gone uh, beyond the Design Review Commission, the City Council has overturned the de Design Review's decision. You want to start with that, Bob? Sure. Uh, I think that, you know, design review is probably the best thing that we can do in a democracy. Uh, the thing about design review is, is that it can't make good things happen. It can only minimize the effect of bad things happening. Uh, and, you know, occasionally it can even hamper something very good from happening. Uh, because I think just by its very nature, it really has to sort of strike a line across the spectrum of human endeavor. And sometimes that line's kind of low. Uh, and uh, I think it's also only as good as the people that are on the design review board and, as you pointed out, how much backing they get from the city council. You know, occasionally, you know, great things will happen and nothing can prevent them from happening, but there's not much that really can help them. I think, you know, if you remember back some of you could remember back when the, uh, the, uh, the Guggenheim Museum was designed in New York, and they did everything they could to stop it, and it got built anyway. And when they were going to uh, add on to it a few years ago, everyone was up in arms again because they were going to be desecrating a landmark. So, so, you know, the perceptions of these things change very, very quickly. And I think that the only, you know, way that uh, you can have great design review is to have, you know, the benevolent despot like... Uh, you know, Baron Hausman or Pope Sixtus V. Uh, you know, I'm sure I have some volunteers in this room. <laughs> Bob Thompson? Oh, I agree. I mean, I think, the arch I think the Design Review Board is imperative, and I think that what it does is uh, act almost as the shepherds for reinforcing and, and uh, enhancing, I think, the design opportunities that are brought, in, you know, brought forth by the development community. I, I think that... Uh, in a sense, it's kind of a thankless job, but I, what I admire about it is that I, and, and, and the way, the reason I feel it's, it's necessary is that the, the, the board really, I feel, it acts as, 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 as a group or a body that takes projects and looks at them from an opportunity standpoint and hopefully encourages development to, to go beyond the basic requirements of what, let's say, the zoning text or any kind of CC&Rs or development requirements that, 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 that they're asked to do. And I think that, uh, um, that I would like to see actually more stringent kind of guidelines uh, enforced in the city to encourage even better better design. I think that we only have, I mean, there's a lot of projects within the downtown urban area where we only have one opportunity to do it right, and I think that the guidelines that are developed by the zoning text become more or less the, uh, those are the guidelines, but they don't really necessarily reflect the intent of what the overall planning goals of the city are in terms of long-term range, and I think that in order to realize the, the best developments for those communities, the issue of intent needs to be brought forth, and uh, I think design review boards have a great uh, opportunity to interject, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, good constructive input that will ultimately make the project a lot better. Yeah, I just want to say one thing before uh, Tom starts, is that, you know, Tom has done a great job on the design review board, uh, you know, for a long time, and uh, He's going to be very difficult to replace. I guess he's 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 resigning, but but uh, uh, it's really only as good as the people that are on it. I don't think that better guidelines help it. Uh, uh, Bill Pedersen was telling me that that he, he was asking me about you know who's this guy Tom Hacker. He said he had some ideas on our federal courthouse. And I said, well, he's a really good guy. He says, yeah, he had some good ideas. I used them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, Tom, you're so the we sort can of make good things. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, you're the sort of freshest voice of experience. How is there anything you would do to change this process? Well, I, I think the I think the problem is that the that the debate here is often characterized as a debate between architectural idealism. I think these are your words, in <laughs> fact, between architectural idealism and financial expediency. And I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think that the and I think the reason it works in Portland is that the purpose for the design commission is to help ensure the quality of life for the public. And that has mostly to do with the street level. It's really not an architectural review board. I mean, it's not looking at the architecture of the buildings and, and, and critiquing them as an overall building form or even architectural 
um, you know, um, style, it's, it's really looking at what are the things that make life good for people at the street level and in the city as, pub as a kind of public place. And, and we've tried to really stick with that. I mean, we get into situations all the time in the, in the, in the design commission where we see buildings which may not please one or the other of us in terms of the kinds of materials or styles or whatever, but we try to stay with the guidelines that have to do with street frontage of glass and interest and being able to see into buildings and the scale of things at that level, um, signage, all those kinds of things. So I think, and I think, and I have a very, very strong uh, positive feeling about what that has done. In fact, I, it's not a feeling of mine. What, hap what happened a few times w on the board, when, on the commission when I was on it, is that people would come and sort of act angry that they had to be in front of this design commission, and they'd have a piece of property in downtown Portland, and they would sort of grouse about, geez, you know, this is going to cost me a lot more money to make this place really work for the pedestrian, and why do I have to do this anyway? And I would always say, that piece of land you have would have about a third the value that it has if this design commission hadn't been making this place for so many years have the kinds of qualities and richness of urban life that it does. I mean, Portland, you all know that. When people come to Portland from other cities, even New York, you know, my brother comes from New York and says, wow, what a great city. New Yorkers don't often admit that any other city has any <laughs> life in it. And it's, the, it's true. I mean, this city is looked to all over the country, in fact, even the world, I think, in some ways, as an example of how a city, a modern American city with, you know, with all of the kinds of pressures that are on it economically to maintain that kind of vitality and viability. And I think the design, it's not the commission itself, it's the, I think the wisdom of people who in the 70s put together to design guidelines and develop that process. My own feeling about what would make it stronger, I got sort of exasperated in the last year and a half or so because because it's working so well, there have been more and more districts added to the, to the design district um, agenda. And what that means is that the people who are working on what used to be the Downtown Design Commission are now working on several other districts, Lloyd District and Northwest District and other places, and they get, I, what I think would strengthen it is to have a down, Downtown Commission that would deal with really the sort of urban core issues and then have satellite groups who are from the areas that are being affected work in those other areas in conjunction with particular guidelines that are written for those areas. And by doing that, give everyone who's on the commission or on one of the satellite commissions a chance to, be, to concentrate more, to get into the issues in greater depth. Thanks. Um, <coughs> one last question, then we'll let you have your turn with these guys. Um, when we think of an architect, what we usually think of is a designer, you know, a person concerned with aesthetics and function. Um, but there's an architect that has been getting a lot of press lately, um, a guy named Jamie Lerner, who has offered something of a different image, that of the politician. He's been the mayor of Curitiba, Brazil, for 12 out of the last 21 years. And during his tenure, a city of uh, 1.5 million um, people, I in a, a city of 1.5 million people, he's implemented a transit system that serves more people now than, that of than the transit system of Buenos Aires. And uh, his policies have created more green space per capita uh, than any city in the world. And his recycling program um, is, is considered a, a model for uh, third world um, cities. Um, what I'm wondering is if we could put each of you in for a moment in the driver's seat of Portland. Maybe not as the mayor as we currently know it, but uh, something of a, uh, of a, in a strong mayor system, maybe where you could actually, you know, really implement policies from the top down. And I'm wondering what, um, say, three things that you would do if you were, could be boss here for, for four years. Bob Thompson, why don't you start? Well, I don't know if I can get three, but I, I, I know one of them that, that, that's really, uh, I think, important to me is one of the, one of the things the, that I feel very strongly about if I had opportunities to uh, initiate uh, policy, so to speak, would be to really go back and look at the east side development, the east river bank development. I, I think one of the, the, the really unique things about Portland is, is, is your perception of it, particularly as you arrive and coming from the airport, coming from the east, and I mean with the uh, 
you look at all of the the, the, the views, the opportunities of, of the redevelopment of that side of town could offer us, uh, and particularly I think as in terms of as it relates to more, again, housing and entertainment type of functions and activities. I, I look at the what's going on with the arena district, or I'm not the arena, the arena project with OMSI and the opportunities that lie between there. It's always unfortunate in, in historically when you look at uh, the river banks in Portland as well as a lot of other cities as, as time's gone on uh, with the uh, development of the freeway where all of these great uh, warehouse areas and, and wharfs and dock areas have been torn down for, for projects like that and the opportunities that have been lost uh, as a result of that. I think that there is some phenomenal opportunities that exist for us to come back in and look at really redeveloping that that area into very viable, uh, um, exciting types of, uh, of 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 uses. And I think that's uh, I think if from a if I could uh, really focus on on a particular project, I think that would be one of them. Bob Prasca. Well, I think that three things that I do is is that uh, I would make sure that we had. Uh, very strong charismatic planning director and give him or her the planning funds to come up with some compelling visions for different parts of the city, the east side, the waterfront, that certainly is part of it. Uh, the other thing I do is I would continue to forge a strong uh, relationship with the business community because uh, those of you that have not been around as long as I have, the last 25 years, a lot of this started when government got together with the business community and the citizens and really forged this partnership. And I would have a public corporation that could deal with specific projects in this post uh, uh, Measure 5 atmosphere and be able to take specific projects to the voters. Uh, I believe that Portland, uh, the people of Portland would support good ideas. I think every time that we've had a good idea, for the most part, the citizens have supported it. Uh, and just one thing I want to finish on is, is that, uh, you know, we have this beautiful city and everyone admires it, but we all have to remember that it's very, very fragile. And it's not going to take too much to turn it the other way. And that now that we don't have the things that we had with urban renewal and uh, I think that we have to find other vehicles to preserve what it is we have and have it develop in the face of this incredible growth because if we don't, it's going to disappear. Uh, believe me. Uh, it didn't take long for what happened, the bad things to happen to happen. You know, before the Second World War, uh, Portland was a very nice city. They destroyed it in about 10 years uh, because of growth and change. So it can happen again. Tom? Well, I, I, I think um, I mean, it's an interesting parallel, I think, here in Portland with what you were talking about with Lerner in, in uh, Argentina. The, the fact is, I think one of the reasons that this city is as good as it is is because there was that kind of leadership here um, in the 70s when, uh, when this kind of urban renewal and, and the partnership between business and the, and the planning uh, uh, people occurred and the beginning of the design uh, guidelines for the downtown and I think really critically important was the al already then the development of, of, of a uh, proposal for the light rail system which has infused the city with a tremendous amount of, of energy uh, from, from the communities around it. So those things, I mean, wh when I was thinking about this question I was thinking that in fact we have had that kind of, of experience here of, of really strong publicly minded political people who have helped make those things happen and we need to keep making it happen but it as, as Bob said and be vigilant about it but it is happening here and it has been um, I think that one of the things that I mean we all have talked and I agree with Bob Thompson about the sort of mixed use and commercial development and housing and all of that and I think the one thing that could use more emphasis in Portland but certainly also in the rest of the, of the country, is to develop a more positive sense of public life, of sort of civic life, which I, I feel like, I mean, I deal every day with the, tele, with the television and the radio with people sort of, the word angry happens about a thousand times a day on the radio about how people feel about the, the government or public life. I'm angry at this, I'm angry at that. 
mean, come on, let's be more optimistic. We need, we need to be more optimistic about who we are as a civic people. And I think that um, um, if I were mayor, this was the question, was if, if, we, if, if we were mayor, if I were mayor, I would, I would initiate, and this seems like a small thing, but I would initiate a program of what I would call civic design awards. And I would have people come from all over the country, as the AIA does, to do their architectural design awards. And I would, I would uh, do something that would recognize and reward people, both developers and architects and citizens, who did something that added to the kind of optimistic, positive sense of what this city is as a place for civic public activity. And um, the other thing I would do is I would write a directive to the city forester to cut the trees down in front of Portlandia because because they get in the way. I mean, that's one of the really great civic sculptures that I know of sitting on that street. And every time I come to town with friends from out of town, my parents come and I say, wait till you see this great. And you can't see it. You go down in front of it and the trees are covered up. You go by in the car. So as a, as a small aside, I would, I would really like to see this. Small aside. At least it's something you can do. I don't, get an, yeah, I don't get an audience to say this very often, that maybe it'll actually happen. Okay. <laughs> Take the green lights off of the bank tower and, and cut the trees down. <laughs> That's what I like. Thank you, gentlemen.